A few of you have sent me your clicker numbers already. If you haven't yet, please do so, so that way I can connect them. I have not uploaded any of the scores yet, so they won't be there, but I will try and do that later today. So please send me your clicker numbers. It's the one that either shows up on the screen, or if you've got an older one, it's on a label on the back, or potentially in the battery compartment. Is everybody clear on that? <clears throat> Good, so <clears throat> wanted to start today, um, again, as usual, by a quick review of what we talked about last time. Fox 174, didn't bring my model, but small DNA bacteriophage. What's the really fascinating aspect about this in terms of anything else that we talked about so far? Good on my list yet? What makes these viruses different than any of the other ones we've talked about so far? What, what, yeah, what kind of genome do they have? Single-stranded DNA, exactly. So that's really sort of the big take-home message about these guys. And we'll talk about a couple of other single-stranded DNA viruses, but the vast majority are going to be RNA or double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, because of that, it's a really great tool in terms of studying how you go from single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA. So a lot of the original DNA polymerase work was done working on Phi-X-174 and the DNA therefrom, and also the replicative form, so the double-stranded part of the virus genome. Then another fascinating aspect about this, and we'll talk a lot more about assembly as we move on, but Phi-X-174 not only has an internal scaffolding protein, but also an external scaffolding protein. And those proteins give you a procapsid, which allows genome to get put in. And then when they fall off, you no longer have a way for DNA to get in. Then, of course, you need a way for DNA to get out. And that's what I think you were mentioning, David, before about the conformational change that you have with the H protein that makes this huge hole in the membrane, actually both membranes of the host. Uh, and then the diversity, which I think I just covered really briefly at the end. Yes, we found some in this acidic hot lake, but they're also present really in a whole bunch of different environments. And a lot of those studies, and we looked at the very first day where we had all those little spots, which were nucleic acid binding stains. Turns out single-stranded DNA doesn't bind those nucleic acid binding stains very well. so there may be a whole bunch more virions in those environments that we can't detect um, using that kind of stain, which means there are even more virions out there than we thought that there were. So any questions about Phi-X-174? Um, this will definitely be part of the exam happening next Monday. Um, and as usual, yeah, material from today's lecture will be on the exam. Friday will be a review. Okay, and then a couple of people have asked me about extra office hours. I will be trying to arrange some of those, particularly for people who can't come after class. So I'll be trying to post those on D2L. So today we're getting a little bigger. Um, this is the T7 bacteriophage. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the T phages. So we're not going to talk too much more about them in the rest of this class, but you've probably heard about T2, T4. Uh, maybe T3 and T5, uh, lots of different bacteriophages with these strange T numbers. And if you want more detail, you can come borrow my small book on the bacteriophages, uh, which I authored one chapter of, not the one on T7, um, because they've got archaeal viruses in here, and we can argue about whether archaeal viruses are phage, but that's a different story. <clears throat> so a little bit about the, the T phages, and this was the real concept of Max Delbruck and some of his co-workers to sort of standardize the field of molecular biology and trying to understand how a lot of these viruses related to each other. Each researcher had a different name for whatever they were looking at. In fact, we came across this in the lab the other day, right, that we had uh, a you know, SSV10 that wasn't really SSV10, right, Mika, that we were confused about. So. The researchers are always, aren't always very good about using the same terminology for things, and so this was one of the first attempts to get virologists to think about that same terminology. These are larger in terms of their virion size, 
I haven't 3D printed one yet, but it's on my list. Uh, <clears throat> but also in terms of their genomes. Their genomes are larger, and that means that they're becoming less dependent on the hosts. And sort of a rule of thumb, and this is biology, of course, there are always exceptions. The larger the genome, the larger the capsid, the less dependent you're going to be on host machinery. And so we'll see that for T7, it's got a lot of its own enzymes. It's not dependent on the host enzymes, whereas we talked about last time, 5174 is almost completely dependent upon host enzymes for replication purposes. A couple of really fascinating aspects about T4. Um, turns out that transcription of the viral genome is really important for entry, which is really kind of funky. Why do you have transcription being important for entry? But we'll see why that is a little bit later on. And then part of this whole aspect about T7 being pretty host independent it's got lots of its own polymerases that are encoded in the virus genome. And it turns out some of these are incredibly useful, um, also being used for biotechnology purposes. So <clears throat> a couple of the, the key concepts, again, these are very useful in terms of thinking about things to study for exams. No, I don't go back and look at these for individual questions, but general concepts, they're really good. Um, promoter cascades. So we've talked a lot already, we'll talk more and more through the rest of the course, is how you get different amounts of different proteins. And lots of viruses have figured out, i.e. evolved, to do this in different ways. And the case in T7, which also turns out to be true for many, many, many other viruses, not just bacterial ones, but also some of those are infecting animals as well, is this whole idea of a cascade. And so you have one set of genes that are expressed that then will lead to the expression of the next set of genes, which then lead to the expression of the next set of genes. And this whole idea is you need the first set to express the second set, which you then need to express the third set. Um, and these are the, surprise, surprise, early, middle, and late genes um, in the case of T7, but also true for many, many different viruses. And we, so when we talked about one-step growth curves, we talked a little bit about the early genes and the late genes. So. What were early genes and late genes being used for, usually, just in general? Who's up next? Mariana? Yes? Oh, no, not quite. <laughs> so what are, what are early genes usually going to be involved in? Okay, not so much TNG. That was that one specific case, which is exactly true. That's true for the SV40. But what are the, the T antigens? What are they doing? You remember? <laughs> Do you want to toss the, toss the virion to somebody else? What early genes are usually involved in? Anyone else want the? <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you often have to need, need to do first? So after you say, so David, would like, David wants it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the yeah, so it's really about making more of the virus genome. And you're exactly right, Mariana, is that the T antigens are important for making the virus genome. So just big picture-wise, early are going to be important for making genomes and late ones. Who's next? I'm not going to let David answer this one as well. Vanessa? Yeah. What are late genes important for? Toss the virion. <laughs> oh. Pardon? Yeah, which particular kinds of proteins? Okay. Last time, so we talked a little bit about, when we talked about the FOX174, we had those with overlapping genes, and those were the one set of genes, and those that didn't have overlaps were another set of genes. Yeah, so the open reading frames are overlapping or not overlapping. So you had some that were non-overlapping, and that means, of course, that they, they can't accept mutations where the overlapping ones can. Think about what you're holding in your hands. What's that? A virion, which is made up of what? Proteins, right? What particular kinds of proteins? You've got two kinds of proteins. You know, early proteins, late proteins. The early ones are important for making genome. What would the late ones be important for? <laughs> 
Exactly, making structural proteins. So the late proteins are almost always going to be your structural proteins. And what does that mean about the late proteins versus the earlier proteins in terms of amounts that you make? Of which? <laughs> You're right, less of one and more of the other. Exactly, you're going to need a lot more of those capsid protein genes. And so if you think about regulatory processes, you're going to want to have a lot more late gene expression than you have of early gene expression. And we'll talk about how that, that happens as well. Pass the very on to Mika. So I think there, there may be a little bit of disconnect here. So if we're talking about secondary structures in nucleic acids or secondary structures in proteins? Yeah, so secondary structures in proteins are going to be your alpha helices, your beta sheets, et cetera. So you're talking about the, the nucleotides. Yeah, so that's, that's just talking about genomes. That's going to be regulatory purposes. So for the regulatory purposes, you'll need those, those secondary structures. So you like the virion up here? <laughs> Echo, right? How's it? OK. Oops. Uh-oh. Here's a different one. <laughs> I was getting mixed up with like uh, thinking of doing temporally. So if you need to make a lot of your capsid protein, mm -hmm. don't you want to start making them early on so you can make a ton of them? I'm confused as why they're called late genes. Right. So that's actually a great question. So the question is basically, you know, if you have to make a whole bunch of your capsid proteins, why don't you start making them at the beginning? Like the, what happens with the RNA phage, you start making coat protein. That's the immediate thing that you start making. There are different ways of doing it for different viruses. And so one of the reasons to wait to make your coat proteins is you need to make sure you've got enough genome to package them with. And so if you've got a nice way of regulating how much of the early ones and how much of the late ones you're making, then very often it'll be the late ones. But you're exactly right. There is this is biology. We've got exceptions. And in the case of the Q-betas and MS2s, the RNA phage, you're making late proteins immediately, which doesn't really kind of make sense from this you know, big picture kind of thing. Do we still call them late proteins in the MS2 So in the big picture, you would, you would probably call these caps uh, structural and non-structural proteins. Um, and this is more in terms of regulatory and temporal regulation. And then the other um, new concept that we haven't really talked about yet is the whole idea of a concatamer, which is literally just genomes hooked up end to end to end. And we'll see how that works, although it's not actually completely well understood in T7. We know that we get them. Exactly how we get them is another interesting question. So as usual, we'll talk about where they came from, what the structures look like, um, how they get inside the cell. Uh, the inside the cell, actually not unlike 5174, this is the new stuff that's not in our textbook, oh, which does remind me, um, I finally got around to putting textbooks on reserve in the library. So if anyone's gone to look for them yet, um, they're over there. I've got the first edition, second edition of the textbook that we're using. I also have the Flint textbook, which is the one that we used many years ago, but I'll take a couple of figures from. Um, so those, are, those should be available as of today and at the very latest tomorrow. Um, so <clears throat> binding and entry um, also turns out big conformational change, making holes in the membrane in terms of getting the genome in. But then the big difference, as I mentioned before, is that it's transcriptionally dependent. It's not like the case for FIX-174 where you sort of have the you know, one-way diffusion where it just seems to come into the cell that way. Here there's clearly a pulling effect which is happening as you're getting the genome coming inside the cell. Replication, these are linear, double-stranded DNA genomes. Their replication, however, actually turns out to be a lot like bacterial replication. And the proteins that are involved are a lot like general replication proteins. So a lot of what we know about replication actually comes from the study of things like um, T7. Partly because of some really fascinating enzymes that come from T7. A lot of them are used in biotechnology, particularly the T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and we'll see why that is a little bit later on. And then, can't not talk about the environmental viruses, those little dots again on the screen. Turns out that these kinds of viruses, also called podoviruses, um, podo for foot, 
and this is this really short tail at one end, um, are extremely common in the environment. And in fact, this is a paper last year, maybe even more common than we thought that they were. Okay, so where did these guys come from? Um, T phages. Um, T1 through 7, I think, or actually no, T1 through 9 were the original ones. Um, these were a bunch of different viruses that a bunch of different research groups were working on. They had Greek letters, they had numerals, they were just all over the place. And the group around Max Delbruck and a lot of ex-physicists who had nothing to do because the Manhattan Project was over and decided they wanted to do biology, um, decided that they wanted to have a group of researchers working on the same defined viruses because you want to answer the big questions, you want to make sure you answer it for all of these different ones rather than one versus another. And they decided they wanted to work with lytic viruses. And lytic viruses, particularly because they didn't want to bother with all of these integrated provirus things, which made things way more complicated. And yes, we'll talk about Lambda after the midterm, which is the classic example of that. So just looking at an infection, that infection blows apart the bacterium. And you just have a one step, again, like these one step growth curves that we talked about before making it a lot easier to study the infection processes. Uh, also, they also wanted to use E. coli because E. coli was really easy to grow. Lots of good genetics in E. coli. So E. coli and then standardize the different viruses that people were working with. And that you know, happened really quite well. Turns out that these were just random numbers at the time. Turns out that the T even bacteriophages, two, four, six and eight are extremely similar to each other. The T odd bacteriophages, you know, one, three, um, five, seven, um, are actually quite different from each other. Um, the only things which are similar are T7 and T3. And that's partly because when this was developed, they didn't really have a good handle on the genetics and particularly the genomes of all of these. They saw the plaques that they had on lawns and so the differentiation was based on those different plaque morphologies. And to some extent, very, very early electron microscopy. They got these phage from a commercial phage preparation. What would that commercial phage preparation be likely to be? Where do you think they may have gotten it from? Maria. David Lee. Where do you think a commercial phage preparation may have come from? Potentially, but what, what would you want to use phage for? So I maybe should back up again. This is right after the Second World War, so it's late 40s, early 50s. Yeah, so it was a literally a medical phage prep that they used um, to do this. Of course, later on the antibiotics. But yeah, it was a, it was a medical phage prep that they used. And then, um, well, and of course, you get lots and lots because this is something you need large quantities of. And then. <clears throat> Another reason that people got excited about T7, and it turns out to be, again, very similar to T3, is there were lots of really good mutants. And a lot of what we'll talk about in terms of the genome and understanding of early, middle, and late genes comes from the study of various different mutants that you could make in these viral genomes. And then, of course, these are, are potoviruses, which are pretty common in the environment. So what does that structure actually look like? Again, I've got to fire up my 3D printer, make some more of these. Um, this is the... <clears throat> structure of a typical potovirus. This particular one is T7, but they all look about the same. Uh, they have an icosahedrally symmetric head and then a tail structure. And it's a little hard to see here. Um, I've got the blue lines on here, which are supposed to represent um, our H and K. So you've got an H of 1 and a K of 1, 2, 3. So and I with two, sorry, it's one, two. I can't, even, I can't even see it on my screen here. Okay, so where we have our hexamers and our pentamers. So step back here. Let me turn on the, uh, the pen. So we start here at a five fold axis, and then we need to get to this five fold axis up here at the top. Here's that next five fold axis right there. Hard to draw with these guys. Um, and so you need to go from five fold axis to a hexamer to the next hexamer the next pentamer. So 1H, 
2 of k, which gives you a t equals 7, because h squared, which would be 1 plus 1 times 2, is 2 plus 2 squared. And I've had a couple of people already come to my office hours, and other people will be interested in office hours in terms of looking at these structures. I, if you've looked at some of the old exams, you'll see that I will put things like this on exams um, in terms of understanding. Because it tells you a lot about the structure, just knowing that t number. A, the number of capsid subunits which are present there. B, the different orientations that they have relative to each other, et cetera. So uh, what I don't expect you to remember is that this is GP10. I can't remember all of these names. We're going to have a ridiculous number of them later on anyway. Um, but that's the, just the, the head structure. The tail is set up really quite differently. Um, first, you have one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, which is down here, which is now replaced by this portal protein. Now, portal proteins um, are kind of like what they sound like they should be. They're literally a hole that then allows the genome to get out or the genome to get back in. And it turns out that these portal proteins are some of the best conserved of any of the genes that you'll see in any viral genomes. And so if you're just looking through a viral metagenome database, and we'll get back to this right at the end, you'll see sequences that are similar to portal proteins. And so if you just have a random sequence, and it's got something that looks like a portal protein, that's going to be something which is clearly viral. It's not something which is obviously going to be a host protein. So connected to this portal protein, interestingly enough, almost all portal proteins have, can we get this to actually work? And done. Um, <clears throat> the portal proteins themselves are 12-fold symmetric. So somehow you have this symmetry mismatch between your five-fold axis of symmetry and then you know, six or 12 subunits that you have stuck onto that. But then once you have that, onto these portal proteins are very often, get this to, there we go, tail proteins. And they're almost always six of these. So six tail proteins attached to this portal. And then something in the middle here as well. And this is also known as the core protein. It turns out when you do a cryo-electron microscopy, like we talked about for some of the new SSRNA phage, there's density on the inside. And that density on the inside is both protein and nucleic acid. Um, and the proteins are what's called this core structure. And we'll see a little bit later, the core actually extends quite a way into the structure and then goes out here at the end as well. The density for the DNA is an approximately 40,000 base pair linear double-stranded DNA. So finally getting to the double-stranded DNAs, um, which have um, pretty unique ends, and I'll, I'll get back to those unique end structures a little bit later on. One of the things about not being able to sequence was you know, a bit of a drag. How do you know it was approximately 40 kilobase pairs? It's partly because electron microscopes were developed more quickly than sequencing technology. So you could literally look at the DNA under an electron microscope and measure how long it was, and then go back to Watson and Crick's structure and say, OK, every 10 base pairs, um, that should be about, what was it? No, 10 base pairs, that's one turn, repeats at 3.2 nanometers, was it? 3.4, OK. That's, that's why I need to ask you guys. Um, I don't need to remember it. I taught molecular last term. Um, so <clears throat> just literally by that, by looking at 12 microns, then you can calculate out it ends up being about 40,000 um, base pairs. And when they finally did the sequencing, um, that worked out also really well. So what does this genome look like? Um, just when they did the sequence, which actually did come relatively quickly after sequencing technology was developed, it looked like it had about 50 open reading frames present in the genome. And because of the genetic tools that people had found, they had started to label all of these genes just with numbers. So like you know, GP8, GP10. Those are those major capsid proteins, the classic late proteins, um, and there was a lot more of them. They also were able to study the RNA just by looking at transcripts which were being made, and they found three different sets of transcripts just in terms of their infection process. So early, middle, and late. Um, and in some cases, when we talk about some of the eukaryotic viruses, people just call these immediate early. Um, and early and late. So late, 
classic, these are going to be our structural proteins. The middle proteins and early proteins are those going to be involved in making genome. And also, and what we haven't talked about yet, a lot of these early or immediate early are often involved in regulating cellular processes in some way. And actually gets back to your comment about the T antigens earlier on. Um, T antigens are important for tumor formation, and so they're also involved in changing what happens with the host. So these early genes, we can expand it to go beyond just early being involved in making genomes, but also early involved in modifying something about the host. And so we'll talk about these individual ones um, a little bit later on. We'll talk about transcription um, later on as well. But just at this point, about 50 open reading frames, um, each of them divided into different parts. And so when they did the genetics, they only saw that there was one gene here. And they said, this is gene one. And then later on, people found that there were genes that were mapping in a different place in the genome, so they had to give them different numbers. So how does it get in? Binds to lipopolysaccharide. What else binds to lipopolysaccharide? Which other virus that we've talked about? Recently, Alex? Yeah. Which other one talks about, uh, which, pass the, pass the virion back to Alex. Which other virus have we talked about? Right behind you. There's the Alex, yeah. <laughs> which other? Virus we talked about recently that binds to LPS? Really recently, like Monday? Yeah, <laughs> so the PIAC 174 um, also binds um, to LPS. Different, however, from PIAC 174, we've got the H protein. This doesn't have a equivalent to the H protein. Um, this has more like a drill, um, GP16 which drills through the membrane. And just the fact that it's 16, that already tells you it's a pretty long distance down the genome. That's where a lot of those late proteins are. So drills through, and then about 850 base pairs of the genome gets in. But I just told you it was 40 kilobases, right? That's not very much of the genome. This is because the cell doesn't want to be infected by a virus. Again, to totally over the anthropomorphize here and has defense mechanisms, uh, particularly restriction in nucleases. So if you have a small amount of your genome that comes inside the cell, then it's not going to get broken down immediately. And it turns out that once it gets brought into the cell, that particular small piece of the genome, that 850 base pairs, has some really good promoter sequences for the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So great minus 10 and minus 35 sequences. So bacterial polymerase jumps on there, starts to transcribe. Um, one of the neat things about the bacterial RNA polymerase is it's also got helicase activity. It moves the genome. So literally what it does is it starts to pull the genome inside the host. And we'll see how that works um, a little bit later on. But first I wanted to briefly talk about how this binding and the, the core takes place. There's a paper published actually about six years ago now, uh, by, I believe, the author of the chapter in our textbook on T7, um, among other people, where they did cryo-electron tomography. And so cryo-electron tomography is, you know, Nacho talked a little bit about the negative stain and the cryo-EM for single particle. We take lots of pictures of, of different particles and then average them all together. Tomography is a little different. What you do is you take a single particle and you move the electron microscope around and then take lots of pictures from different angles of that particular particle. Um, and this is really important if you have, say, for instance, a interaction of a virion with a host cell. Because it's going to be really hard to average literally thousands to tens of thousands to get high resolution structures, which are you know, what we've printed a bunch of these things for. You know, that the, the model of the virion, to some extent, comes from that single particle reconstruction. Here we're talking about taking lots of different angles of one particular interaction or a few particular different interactions. You get much lower resolution structures, but you can look at fewer particles in this process. And so what they did is they saw these images up here in gray at the top where if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see that these tail fibers are attached in slightly different places. And it seems that you just have you know, one tail fiber attached in most cases and then you have a bunch of tail fibers attached 
and then you see this tube formation that takes place. And so this is the cartoon format right here. There's a nice video that they put together for this, which we can take a look at here. Hang on, let me go over and bring this in. Okay, so here is the T7. Capsid, here's the core part again that I mentioned before. Now if you look at this tail structure, this is the portal protein, doesn't have the tail fibers in here. Um, this was actually kind of nice because one of the advantages with working with these guys is that you have lots and lots of mutants and you can actually use mutants that don't have tails. And if you have a tailless mutant, you can really focus in on the parts that you're not particularly interested in or are interested in but are interested in how they're interacting with the rest of it. So this tailless mutant was very important for getting a nice high resolution structure because the tails are actually much more floppy and flexible and if they're floppy and flexible you're never going to get a really nice structure for them. So here we then they add the tail fibers and then here we have the virion which hopefully you can also see a little bit of the, the t equals 7 symmetry um, on here with our five-fold axis here, five-fold axis here, one, two, one. Um, and each of these tail fibers, again, based on those tomograms, seems to come down individually. And so here are a couple of virions getting close to the E. coli. It's about to scale here. Here we have the virion attaching with one of its tail fibers, and then probably detaching, attaching with a different tail fiber, somewhere else. And again, this is all interpretations of those tomograms. And then at some point, you have multiple tail fibers that interact, probably because there's some kind of secondary receptor beyond the LPS that we don't know about. And then once you have all of these that have associated, then you have the big conformational change where the core releases, and I'm not sure about this whole compression thing, I think that was artistic license, but the internal core compresses and then, again, undergoes a conformational change, not unlike what happens with the H protein, and then makes a hole through the outer membrane, inner membrane, and then about 850 bases comes out here on the other side. So that is our infection and insertion process. It's the other you know, cartoon version of looking at that. Now we've got the bit of genome in. Now the cellular RNA polymerase will bind to these strong promoters, start to transcribe, and start to pull the genome in. This is bacteria. So if you have transcription, you also have translation happening at exactly the same time. So as soon as that RNA comes out of the RNA polymerase, ribosomes are going to grab onto it and start to translate. And they're going to start to translate different proteins. And these are going to be which of those genes? Early, middle, or late? Early, exactly. And the ones that are right at the beginning of the genome, which is the first part that comes in. Probably the most important of those early or class one genes is the one that encodes this protein right here, GP1. Now, there are also those other GPs that are less than, oh yeah, Micah, sorry. So that's the protein. Yeah. Oh, oh, the, this one? Yeah. So where it's already injected that protein into the mm -hmm. the Right, on the very far right? Yeah. yeah. Is that lit without the RNA structure? Is that the RNA structure? Oh, so the, the, the coin thing at the bottom here? No, that's still part of the core protein that's averted into, into the cell. Yeah, so the RNA polymerase itself will, and again, it's a cell, this is all viral at this point. It's the cellular polymerase. And they try and show that um, here because it's, it's green. Um, and this you know, green is the cellular RNA polymerase. So, and I'm emphasizing cellular RNA polymerase because gene 1 is now the viral RNA polymerase. This is a really fascinating RNA polymerase. And again, I really should be saying DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The first really fascinating, in fact, really useful part of this is it's a single subunit. 
DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So why is single subunit so important? Tristan? Tristan, yeah? Okay. Jasmine? Yeah. Got to, got to get the virion? Alex will give you the virion. <laughs> so why is a single subunit DNA-dependent RNA polymerase so bizarre and interesting? Pardon? How many subunits do you usually see? More than two. <laughs> no. Um, so the bacterial um, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase has beta, beta prime, alpha 2, and sigma, at least if you're starting, and then also omega. If you think about the eukaryotic RNA polymerases or the archaeal polymerases, it's 10 to 12 subunits. So this guy is bizarre. Um, that it's a single subunit DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. But single subunit is great because it means there's just one gene, and one gene, which means it's really useful for biotechnology applications. The other question, which is way, way harder and probably not one that you want to answer <laughs> early this morning, um, is what does this structure look like? Anybody for this one? Christian, do you have an idea? Yeah, so with, that's exactly right. So what kind of structures have those right hands? Wait a sec. Give him, give him a second, Diana. <laughs> he needs a virion. It will help. <laughs> the right hand. With the, and you're exactly right. Palm, fingers, palm, thumb. Exactly. So DNA polymerases have this structure. So DNA-dependent DNA polymerases is you know, a better way of talking about it. So take DNA and make DNA. So this is also really interesting from an evolutionary perspective that DNA polymerases may have actually evolved from these RNA polymerases. And when we look at RNA polymerases, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases later on, it turns out they also have this hand-like structure. So RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, that's what you need in an RNA world. And now you can make you know, a DNA polymerase from a structure which looks a lot like that, and also a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase from a structure that looks like that. And then these other you know, DNA-dependent RNA polymerases probably came along a lot later. So this may be sort of the, at least an example of one of these relic uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Yeah. So that's part of the idea, is that you're sort of a bridge between the two. And we talk about the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and particularly the reverse transcriptases, which is sort of the, the smoking gun RNA-DNA world kind of thing um, later on. And I give you one guess what kind of structure the reverse transcriptases have. <laughs> also the right-hand structure, exactly. Um, so the other thing about these polymerases, and this is really important in terms of thinking about how the viruses work, is that they don't recognize minus 10, minus 35 sequences like the normal bacterial polymerases do. They recognize very different promoter sequences. Um, and it turns out that they recognize those promoter sequences really, really well in the absence of any extra kinds of proteins. Again, it's all just a single subunit dependent RNA polymerase. And they crank. This is about two and a half times as fast as any of the cellular um, polymerases do. So this is a absolutely awesome enzyme, which we'll get back to from bio, um, biotechnology purposes a little bit later on. But I need to break from talking. So what are we going to do? We'll do a clicker question, which hopefully should be very straightforward. Entry of most of the genome of T7 into the host is going to be due to replication by a host polymerase replication by a viral polymerase, transcription by a host polymerase, transcription by a viral polymerase, translation by host ribosomes. 
10, 21 people here today. Seems all right. Five. Okay. We do not have a consensus, so please discuss with your friends, neighbors, etc., what you decided on and why. Okay, let's go again. So, replication by host polymerase, replication by viral polymerase, transcription by host polymerase, transcription by viral polymerase, translation by host ribosomes. You can continue to discuss here in you know, the next 30 seconds or so. Ten, five. Okay, the <clears throat> majority, vast majority, in fact, like the, its transcription by the host polymerase. A couple people think it's the viral polymerase. People, which people thought it was a viral polymerase? I'm not going to point you out, but one of you who has, one of the two, <laughs> uh, what's your thoughts behind that? Why would that be? Uh, they that, that, yeah, the 23 nucleotides, which I haven't talked about yet. I did, however, emphasize that it was just the first 850 that come in and then get made. What's the other aspect about that polymerase, which is a reason that it might be the viral polymerase rather than the host polymerase? It's a lot faster. So the answer really is the viral polymerase. It's not the host polymerase. I didn't say this, but I was hoping that, you know, making those, and it is written in the, textbooks, if you'd done the reading, it would have had that too. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so it's really the viral polymerase which is involved here, not the host polymerase. Okay, so select answer. This one is correct. That makes sense? Yes? Okay. Okay, so what about those other early genes? Um, okay, we already probably talked about ad nauseum, the T7 um, specific DNA dependent RNA polymerase. <clears throat> there are two other ones um, which come in even earlier. Um, the first one is a gene which inhibits the cellular restriction endonucleases. Restriction endonucleases love to chop up exogenous double-stranded DNA. Great defense mechanism against double-stranded DNA viruses, so the virus netting rid of this is very important. If you get rid of this, the virus doesn't replicate very well. Um, point seven actually also inhibits the E. coli RNA polymerase, which would be another kind of smoking gun that this is the 
viral polymerase, which is going to be bringing in the rest of the genome. So once that happens, now you start to express these class two, the early or middle genes. These are going to be all the ones which are involved in replication of the virus genome. So these, all of these class two genes have promoters that are the T7 DNA polymerase promoters. Um, not really critical which ones these are, but they've got DNA ligases. Um, only thing with a red line underneath it, RNA polymerase, primase, DNA polymerase. These are the ones which I expect you to potentially remember. Not the numbers, just that they have these. DNA polymerase, and this is now your DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, so that's going to be what's replicating the viral genome. Endonuclease chops up the host cell DNA. Um, so this infection really trashes the host cell, and all of the nucleotides that are gained from breaking down the host genome then get incorporated into the viral genome. It also cleaves the concatamers that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And there's also this protein called lysozyme, um, which helps to get the virus outside of the cell, which is what you understand from a lysozyme, but also inhibits the activity of the T7 RNA polymerase. And this will be important right at the end or potentially after the midterm. We'll see how far we get. So how are these all being made? Again, they're all going to be made by T7 RNA polymerase dependent promoters. They've got lots of different promoters. All of them terminate in the same place or almost all in the same place. One thing you'll notice here is that these transcripts all overlap with some of these <clears throat> late genes or the class three genes. If you remember GP10, that's the major capsid protein. This is the one that has the vast majority of the RNAs, so not surprisingly, a whole bunch of RNAs, you're also gonna be making a whole bunch of that protein. So here, it's not so much you're regulating the amount of translation of anything, it's just you got more RNA, you're gonna have more protein. <clears throat> so very little translational regulation actually takes place um, in T7. It's almost all about the RNAs being made. So <clears throat> this, get this to work, is our class two genes. After you've made class two genes, then of course you make your class three genes. The class three genes actually have even better promoter sequences. When I say better, closer to consensus, you're gonna have more binding of the T7 RNA polymerase to these late promoters. And particularly you have, not surprisingly, the pr genes for capsid protein and your tail proteins, also your portal protein. And then you start to make some of these proteins that are really critical for lysis, particularly this Holin protein. And Holin protein does exactly like what it sounds. It makes a hole in the membrane once you have enough of these particular proteins. And just like we talked about with lysis proteins earlier, you don't want to make too many of them early on because if you do, then the cell is gonna lyse before you actually have um, any kind of active viruses. These, I basically mentioned this already. Um, these are now these class three promoters here. Not the number is not important, which is I'm not mentioning them, but they're stronger because they're a closer to consensus sequence for the T7 um, RNA polymerase. And then this T7 lysozyme, as I mentioned before, it has activity in terms of getting outside the cell, but it also shuts down the activity of the T7 RNA polymerase. And basically what that means is it stops the RNA polymerase, pardon me, um, from binding to these class two promoters and only allows it to bind to the class three promoters. So it's also you know, down-regulating your transcription. But again, it's all about transcription here. Just more transcripts, more proteins. Okay. Happy with this? Um, did ever want to talk about genome replication? One of the interesting things about genome replication, these, again, the viruses encode their own DNA-dependent DNA polymerases. They actually also encode a primase, um, so DNA primase <clears throat> complex. They've got their own helicase. But what's really interesting is that these are DNA polymerases just like all other DNA polymerases. So what do DNA polymerases need? 
What do DNA polymerases need to polymerize? They need, well, how do they make their five prime ends? Where do they, what do they do? What does the DNA polymerase do? Yeah, uh, because, uh, well, you don't, have the, you don't have the virion. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you clearly aren't going to be able to answer. Yeah, the back. Sorry. You need primers. What kinds of primers? RNA primers. So you could get that from an RNA primase, but what did I spend a whole bunch of time talking about right at the beginning? This thing that binds to a single subunit thing. Single subunit thing that's really important for making RNAs, like your messenger RNAs. The T, it's the T7 RNA polymerase. So it turns out that the T7 RNA polymerase is what makes the primer that is used then for replication of the genome. So without the T7 RNA polymerase, you're not going to get any genome replication. And so that's what's being made right here. Our T7 RNA polymerase makes the primer that the T7 DNA polymerase will extend, um, has standard semi-discontinuous replication, but this origin of replication is right towards the very left end of the genome, and that's that first piece that comes in. That, of course, is being transcribed by the cellular polymerase, which you know, you're not using anymore because you've got this viral polymerase. You've also made a protein that shuts down the activity. So you, now you have your replication that happens at the left end of the genome. Replication fork is going to zoom down the genome to the right, but it's actually following the RNA polymerase. So you don't have this same problem that we had with those RNA phage where you have the replicase and the ribosome running into each other. Everything's going in the same direction. So you don't have to worry about this. So you get lots of <clears throat> double-stranded DNA full length of your genome. The problem with all of these genomes, and actually getting back to the whole idea of an RNA primer, what's the problem with RNA primers? In terms of genomes. Are we enough to answer that one in? Okay. <laughs> Still not there. <laughs> Janon, where's Janon? Is he here yet? No. Okay, so give you a break. I've gotten to the bottom of my list. I need to start again next time. Um, so <clears throat> what the problem with the RNAs is you need to get rid of them, right? That's why you have telomeres. Is you have to have a telomerase, you extend the ends of your genome. So somehow these RNAs need to be gotten rid of. And the way that that happens, you've got an RNAs H, you've got flap endonuclease activity that gets rid of them normally, but then you have the ends of the genomes. And how do you deal with the very ends of the genomes? And the way that T7 deals with the ends of the genomes is it actually makes these concatomeric sequences. And so concatomer is literally multiple copies of the genome hooked up right next to each other. So you have you know, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, all lined up one next to each other. We saw this to some extent where you remember that rolling circle, Phi 174 goes around the genome, and then the A protein will re-ligate it. But if it forgot to re-ligate that, you'd end up with multiple copies of the genome because the polymerase keeps going around and around and around. And we'll see this happens in lots of other bacteriophage genomes and even in some eukaryotic virus genomes. Um, so you end up with these copies you know, end to end to end, and those then somehow have to get packaged. But if you've got these end to end pieces, that's fine because you've got enough time for your DNA polymerase to go through, your replication fork to go through and chew up all the ends. How you get these concatomers is still not completely understood, and there's a figure in this textbook that gives some ideas on how they think it happens, but it's still very much up in the air. And we'll talk about um, how you can get other concatomers. If you've got a rolling circle, it's easy to get concatomers. But with these linear genomes, it's actually a little bit tougher to get these concatomers. Okay, so this should be a clicker question that everybody gets right. Yes? Okay. So, <clears throat> move on. It will actually move now, which it won't. Oh, low battery. Okay, fine. We'll do move forward. Technology. I do love it so. Um, what makes the first primer used by T7 DNA polymerase for replication? T7 DNA primase, T7 DNA polymerase, T7 RNA polymerase, host DNA primase, host RNA polymerase. 
aim for that 100%. Two, one, stop, show. It's always C, right? Whenever Stephen has a click question, the answer is always C. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, the answer is it's the T7 RNA polymerase. It's not the T7 dynamic polymerase. That was what makes the primer for the second strand, but not the, the first strand. And I'm not entirely sure how to select the correct answer here. Is my remote not working? So I will do that um, online afterwards. So, but I've got these scores. So <clears throat> now we have our genome. We've got all of our <clears throat> proteins. They need to get fit together. Did we skip one? Yeah. So how do you get the functional virion? We've got all these concatomers, right? So it's a genome hooked up end to end to end to end. First, what happens is the capsid is made, and you have the portal protein. That portal protein recognizes a protein which binds to the end of the genome. And then it stuffs one copy of the genome inside the capsid. And once it gets to the end of the genome, that protein chops it off again. That protein goes and finds another portal in a new empty capsid, stuffs in a genome, goes to the next one, and so on and so forth. These are made as prohead structures, not unlike what we saw with FIX-174. Procapsid structure that allows the packaging to take place. Once you have the genome in, then you'll assemble the rest of the core structure and the tail structure. And then to get out, you've got your holin protein, which has been slowly being made more and more of. That holin protein actually makes a hole in the inner membrane. Then lysozyme will chew up the peptidoglycan. And then there's a second protein, which makes a hole in the outer membrane, and that's how you have lysis that takes place. So in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about the applications. Um, this is very important for people who work in recombinant DNA, trying to express proteins. As I have probably talked about far too much already, the T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase is a great enzyme. It just needs one protein, so one gene to express it. It goes really fast. It has very specific promoters that it binds to. So what you can do in your favorite E. coli that you want to make a bunch of your favorite protein, which is encoded by gene X here, is you have gene X that you put into your E. coli next to a T7 RNA polymerase promoter. And then somewhere else in the cell or a different plasmid, you have the T7 RNA polymerase gene. And again, you just need one. You don't need all of these rest of them. It's the great thing about having a single gene polymerase that you can then induce somehow. So very often through an IPTG, which induces the LAC promoter, you make this T7 polymerase. That T7 polymerase can make a whole bunch of gene X, and you get a whole bunch more of your favorite protein. T7 lysozyme is also often used in this case, um, particularly if you have some kind of toxic protein. Gene X makes your E. coli really sick. Um, and you include then the lysozyme, because that will shut down the activity of the T7 polymerase. You may have a small amount of it being made here, even in the absence of induction. Everybody remembers from the LAC operon, you have a little bit of expression even in the absence of any induction. And that gets shut down by the T7 lysozyme. However, if you start to make more of this, again, you've done some induction, then that will overcome this inhibition, and you start to make a whole bunch more of your gene X. It turns out that this doesn't actually have to be done in E. coli. You can also just make a whole bunch of DNA that has a promoter sequence on it for these T7 polymerases in order to make lots of RNA. So if you want to do RNA evolution for instance. You'll get a gene which has a T7 polymerase promoter, and you literally buy T7 polymerase, put it into your reaction, and it will transcribe a whole bunch of RNA for you. So it's really useful for making very large quantities of RNA. I'm going to just skim over these last slides. Since I'm skimming over them really fast, I'll have 18 questions on the exam. No. <laughs> At most, there'll be one question on the exam. I just wanted to mention this really briefly. Talk about at the beginning, there are lots of these potoviruses. 
that you find in environments, particularly things like the open ocean. Um, there's a, how many of you are taking microbiology now, or microbial ecology? Um, heard about SAR-11, probably one of the, the most common bacteria on the planet. Um, people used to think there were no viruses that were associated with it um, until about six years ago where um, some of my buddies found one of these protoviruses infecting SAR-11. This is a poor little SAR-11 cell that's completely packed um, with these um, viruses. You can get really nice structures of these. Um, I really mostly wanted to show this because it's got a nice example of that T equals 7 icosahedral symmetry. So you can take a look at that slide and see it. And then the very last one are these, you know, major lineage of non-tailed um, double-stranded DNA bacteriophages. Um, this is all from metagenomic studies where they found these DNA polymerase genes and terminal proteins that look a lot like some of these potoviruses just going out into the environment. So um, another place where you find lots and lots of these viruses. So I won't talk about metabolic engineering with Teach7, also fascinating issue, but we won't talk about it. Just leave it to say that all these bands, this is an SDS page gel, um, where you see basically lots of different proteins at the very beginning of a virus infection. At the end of virus infections, you practically only see the viral structural proteins. So um, I'll have office hours now. Um, people would like some extra office hours, I'll let me know, and I can try and organize some more of them. Review on Friday, exam on Monday.